Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Zachary Carter, a senior reporter at the Huffington Post, who covers Washington, economic policy, the White House, and who is the author of an exciting new book, The Price of Peace, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. Zach, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Rob. Well, you've been a pillar of insight and, how would I say, bearing witness to all the machinations and craziness and ideas and turbulence related to this American political economy for many years. So you've been a good friend of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, not so much in catering to us, but just being a voice and a beacon who's out there that I'm inspired to read and to uh, suggest to others. Well, thank you, Rob. I do my best. Well, Zach, um, let's talk. I mean, right now we're near the end of May 2020. And this pandemic, COVID-19, has just rolled through. And let us say uh, the conventional wisdom doesn't feel well anchored any longer. There's a great deal of emotion and anxiety about what the future pretends. And I'm curious, just uh, kind of wide open, what are you seeing? What frightens you? What inspires you? And what do you, what, what would be your call to action to our listeners? Well, I'll I'll, I'll be honest, you know, I, I'm a inveterate optimist. It's one of the things I like about, uh, about Keynes when I read him, somebody who lived through, uh, periods of immense upheaval and almost constant crisis. Uh, he never, he never lost his faith in the belief that tomorrow could be better than today. Uh, but I don't like a lot of what I see around us today. I, I see, uh, a, a country in the United States that has become so deeply unequal uh, economically, that it, it appears to me to be politically uh, bordering on ungovernable. Um, the, the type of social breakdown that we've been witnessing, even before the election of Donald Trump and and the outbreak of this pandemic, things like you know uh, the the upheaval in Ferguson, Missouri, the Freddie Gray riots, um, the, the the fact that life expectancy declined in the United States for uh, the last two years that it was measured. Um, because of deaths of despair, um, predominantly among uh, lower income white men, uh, things like opioid overdoses and alcoholism, um, to me suggests that we have a society in which working people have become decoupled from the interests, uh, the governing interests of, uh, of the political system. And that, uh, that to me seems very, you know, just morally troubling on, on its face, but also um, politically politically unstable. I, I don't see how um, we get through major crises like uh, like this pandemic w- without a great deal more of people. Um, we, we really are living in different societies. You know, the, the, the decline in, in life expectancy that's happened over the last two years is, is not a, a broad-based decline. Uh, wealthy people are living longer than they've ever lived in the United States. So the, the society is really breaking into uh, at least two different kinds of uh, social universities, maybe maybe more, depending on how you, you pursue the divisions among uh, among race and class. But certainly there's a, there's a sort of breakaway wealth group at the very top, which has unique access to the political system and the unique ability to... Uh, see its interests implemented in public policy, while uh, the vast majority of people in the country are uh, are simply not taken seriously by that system. And I think uh, I think that is that is very troubling. What I I do think is promising is that uh, in the Democratic Party primary in 2020, uh, even though the progressive wing of the of the party ultimately was was uh, trumped by uh, Joe Biden, uh, who represented very openly, the sort of more moderate, cautious, uh, we might call them centrist wing of the party. Um, the, the, those ideas, the, the, the belief that, uh, that, that bold and ambitious action is necessary in order to avert 
the kinds of uh, disasters that we see unfolding in, in our communities every day um, or, or is necessary. That idea seemed to be, I, I think, something the Democrats accepted. I think they were just a little bit too afraid to embrace them uh, in, in this particular election. Uh, so, so you see things, you see polling data on, on something like Medicare for all. It's, it does very well among Democrats. It actually does pretty well among Republicans too. Um, the, the idea that there needs to be some sort of systemic change in the United States in order to fix these problems that we can't just sort of muddle through, uh, that muddling through will actually lead us straight into disaster, I think is, has become sort of the conventional wisdom among the general public, even if it's not the conventional wisdom among the political class. And now it's, there's a huge gap there. And finding a way to make that conventional wisdom for normal people become the conventional wisdom for people in power is, is quite difficult. Uh, but it, it means that the case is not hopeless. And if there's anything, any lesson from the life of John Maynard Keynes, it's that things can always get worse, but they can always get better. And, uh, and you, have to, you have to cling to those, uh, those, pop, those glimmers of hope uh, because, because you don't really have any other choice. Ultimately, tomorrow is coming whether you like it or not, and you can either try to make it better uh, or, or you can uh, bury your head in the sand. And, and I think Keynes was somebody who was, who was always trying to uh, seize the moment in, uh, in the most ambitious way possible. Well, you and I uh, are mutual friends of, of Guy Saperstein and his gang. And uh, I remember Carol Abaddon uh, had a uh, offering on, on the listserv that we, sh we both explore about a gentleman named Stuart Zeckman, who used to be a musical artist. And uh, he was describing his disaffection towards the centrist Democrats in a podcast. And he had cited an anonymous article, I think Ben Smith had written, about a Democratic leader saying, well, you know, the Democratic Party can't go to that progressive place anymore because the population doesn't believe in government. It's not Lyndon Johnson. It's not Franklin Roosevelt at this juncture. But what Zeckman did was he went in the aftermath of reading that article to look at the Gallup polls. And what he found was that most Democrats did, as was surface reported, have great skepticism about governance. Mm -hmm. But what he also found is the reason they were skeptical is they thought that government had been captured by powerful corporate interests and wealthy oligarchs. This is 2011. This is in the shadows of the uh, bailout uh, mm -hmm. during the Obama years as the Republicans were taking over the House, the Senate, and eventually the White House. So I, I, I guess that notion of confidence in expertise, governance, or what we might call a crisis of representation has built building for quite some time. And it's not a secret, you know, I, I think uh, I think the Democratic Party leadership ignores that uh, that that sense among people at its own peril. There, there, there's sort of a weird disconnect in American politics today where there are very well established views uh, that are extremely mainstream uh, about about how the world works and what's going right and what's going wrong. And, and they're, they're shared by people on the left and the right and, and in the center, I think. But within the Democratic Party establishment, there's the, the, you know, the people who actually lead the party day to day, people like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, uh, there, there is a consensus that Democrats uh, don't get things wrong and that everything is, uh, is, is the fault of Donald Trump and his sort of the problems in our society sprang to life in January 2017 and have just accelerated from there. And, and I think, you know, it's hard to argue that Donald Trump hasn't made things much, much worse. I mean, we're living through this pandemic, which is, you know, it's a biological problem, but it's essentially a political problem. Other countries that have uh, implemented better responses to this virus are not suffering the kind of economic damage, the, the kind of human damage that, uh, that, that we are suffering. But 
I, I think the election of Trump himself and uh, is a reflection of the, uh, the the political and social despair that people feel about uh, about their ability to 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 even you know get attention from people in Washington. Uh, and I think that's been reflected in the way that the coronavirus, uh, you know, rescue or bailout packages, however you want to describe them, have been uh, have been negotiated. There was a, a very quick package that was that was uh, approved in late March um, that provided trillions of dollars in funding for corporate America uh, with essentially no strings attached um, and. You know, not not nothing for working people. There was an expansion of unemployment insurance of six hundred dollars a week, which is you know, it's real money for people, especially if you lose your job. No one's going to turn down an extra six hundred bucks a week. But it was not an attempt to look at the world and say, okay, given that we have a, a you know a sort of once in a generation, maybe once in a century crisis on our hands, how do we make sure that this that this society does not come apart? because of this crisis? What, who are the people we want to protect most? There was sort of a, a, an instinctive turn to a handful of policies that people put in place in the, you know, the 1980s or the 1990s that, okay, well, we want to boost unemployment insurance. So it's not a bad idea, but, but why, are, why are we letting people get laid off in the first place? There's no guarantee that when this crisis is over, these companies that have laid these people off are going to hire them back. Um, mm-hmm. The fact that unemployment is going to go is already clearly over 20%, probably going to 25% very soon. Um, th- th- there was an opportunity to say, let's not let these people have their job relationships with their employers be be severed. There was an, And if you weren't going to do that, there was an opportunity to say, okay, let's create a new social safety net that ensures that if people do have that job relationship se- severed, uh, they they're in a condition where they can they can access the basic elements of a good life indefinitely, not just for two or three months. The way that uh, it's it's uh, it's been implemented under under that that package, and now of course uh, you know we're we're entering what Democrats are calling phase four, but it's you know it, it's it's just essentially an attempt to do over that that botched response I think in March, uh, and and we'll see what happens, but. We still don't see big ideas on the table. We see things like a right. trillion dollars for for state governments. It's important. Give them money so that you know cops and firefighters and teachers don't get laid off. That's that's good. Uh, but but it's it's not going to save us from a depression, and it's not going to lift us out of a depression. And I think the the idea that we're going to bounce back from this very quickly, uh, I think, is a, is a, a deep misunderstanding of human psychology. I, th- I think we're we're going to be dealing with the after effects of this disaster for years, if not decades, to come. People are going to remember this, and it's going to resonate through our political system in ways that many of us simply cannot expect right now. now I sense that you're right. In uh, one of the things that, for instance, my research director Tom Ferguson works on is the is the tremendously important role of money in politics. So whether you call yourself Democrat or Republican, or whether you think you're the least worst, (laughs) the responsiveness to concentrated wealth and big corporate interests is the precondition for survival. And I know your peer at ProPublica, Jesse Isinger, has just put out reports where he talks about how the consequences of the bailout is all kinds of small businesses are going out of business, unemployment at the level that you just described. And at the same time, most of the private equity firms that were leveraged to the hilt are up 40 to 60% in their stock price. So there's a whole lot of what you might call distributional ramifications from the structure of this bailout. And I, I do think perhaps after this dreadful experience uh, is behind us, people will go back and scrutinize that. And I'm fearful in one respect that that will deepen despair. And uh, I've, I've used on this podcast the analogy, Franklin Roosevelt with the New Deal escaped the depression and confidence, faith, and gratitude towards governance went up. 
So by the time he was ready for war preparation for World War II, he had a lot of trust and license. What I see now in Washington, and it's, this started with the bailouts of 2009 and the, what Joe Stiglitz calls when the polluters got paid, <laughs> I, I see a despondency. Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street, and it just keeps moving. And then this recent episode, I, I, I'm concerned that people will be uh, what you might call susceptible to despair and potentially authoritarian rule because they have no faith that the process we call our democracy can be at all representative, broadly representative and responsive. And, and how would I say, if, if we poisoned the people's belief in our republic, we're in a very dangerous place. And, you know, I think John Maynard Keynes really spent his life worrying about that exact problem. I, I think the uh, conversion of Keynes into a sort of deficit therapist, the guy who said, you know, the guy who you learn about in Econ 101 courses, who says, you know, you got to spend money in a recession in order to, to get out of the doldrums, um, has, has, has sort of robbed a lot of his thought of, of this political and moral content. He was somebody who was absolutely terrified of the march of authoritarian governments in um, in eras of upheaval. He said he could see that after World War I, there was uh, an intense energy for right-wing uh, authoritarian politics that were that, that was was growing not only uh, in in Germany, but but around the world, and we, we forget this. Before you know, when it, when FDR took took office in, in 1932, there was a very very significant um, right wing fascist movement in the United States that FDR was working very uh, cogently, consciously to put down. So the idea that when when you enter a state of dysfunction, that the state will lose its legitimacy and people will, will, will feel a sort of thirst for a demagogue and, uh, and, and a dictator is something that, you know, I don't think that's even unique to Keynesian thought. I just think he's one of the, one of the people who was able to put that idea into a particularly powerful uh, and emotionally compelling set of terms over the course of his career. And ultimately his economics Everything that he's working on from 1919 until his death in 1946 uh, is is aimed at averting the, this rise of authoritarian politics, and and I just I don't think that our politicians have the same sense of urgency about this or the same recognition that about what is happening, and it's it's a remarkable thing for me to say, because Democrats are going around saying every day that Donald Trump is a is a dangerous authoritarian who is in cahoots with international authoritarians. Um, and I think they're right about that. Um, but they, they do not seem to be governing as if that were the case. And, uh, and they do not seem to have ideas about how to deal with the slide toward authoritarianism um, that I think is happening in, uh, among the American po uh, public. Um, they, they, may, they may, you know, it only takes one spark, right? They, they, could, they could change their minds tomorrow and uh, and we could start seeing some great legislation and and turn things around. I, I think the pandemic is certainly not good for Donald Trump's reelection prospects, but I would not rule out the prospect of him being reelected. Um, so I, I, I think there's this sort of weird moment, which I, I would be I think would resonate very deeply with John Maynard Keynes, where there's, the world is obviously dissolving into chaos and crisis. And yet the leaders are looking around and saying, well, why don't we uh, why don't we have some refundable tax credits uh, for job training? And, and these these are just not the solutions that that are it, it's like they've been indoctrinated in a set of thinking that uh, that makes them incapable. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's not that they're evil people. They just don't they literally don't know how to grasp the world that they're living in. And yet um, they're the people we have to turn to for solutions. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a senior fellow currently at INET, uh, Jeffrey Mann, who's from British Columbia. And he wrote a book on Keynes 
called uh, In the Long Run, We're All Dead. Great book. And the, uh, I agree. And the last chapter is called Revolution After Revolution. And in that chapter, what I, what I really admired was that Jeff had started the book with a skepticism about Keynesian policy. And to just paraphrase, counter-cyclical macro-stabilization has its place in mitigating unemployment or, or keeping the economy on the rails. But Jeff was worried that within what you might call the micro-political economy structure, the corruption and the rot would never be rooted out because the depth of despair would be anesthetized by counter-cyclical, uh, how do I say, mm -hmm. support for the economy. And so you'd trail along through the years and through the decades, and the society would never face that intensity of crisis, which would make it repair itself. But in the last chapter, Jeff says... And this is after the election of Trump, I believe, late 2016, uh, early 2017, he was finishing the manuscript. Mm -hmm. And what Jeff says is, I thought about it, and maybe I had too idealistic a view, and I'm using my own phrase here, of democracy, small d democracy as a corrective thing. And maybe what happens in that deep despair that I thought would be the catalyst to a reaction is that the wisdom of crowds becomes the madness of crowds. Mm. And as he was seeing what was unfolding, he's Canadian, but he was watching the United States. He openly admits that he changed his mind and that Keynes sensitivity to what you might call the continuity of social fabric and the deformity of democracy that prolonged despair could bring to the surface did that, that, that it was by far the better alternative to engage in that stabilization. And uh, I know your, your book is so sensitive to Keynes. It's kind of, in my reading through it, the, the briefing or the, what, I, what I will call the, the briefing we get about Keynes at different points in time is outside of that hydraulic Keynesianism, that mechanical Keynesianism that's associated with the, my alma mater, MIT, and <laughs> you know the Samuelson solo crowd. And it, it, it just, it feels to me like he's a much more vital spiritual, artistic, creative, and times frustrated person from reading your work. And, and I think that's just, I mean, you and Robert Skidelsky are really sharing what a great man looked and felt like. You know, I have a ton of respect for, for both uh, Jeff Mann and, uh, and, and Robert Skidelsky. Uh, I've never met Jeff, but I, I, I talked with, uh, with, with Robert, uh, or, or his lordship, I should say, uh, <laughs> over the course of, of, of of writing this book and i think there is uh there is a sense in which john maynard Keynes has more in common with contemporary poets than he has with contemporary economists uh keynesian or otherwise he's somebody who thinks about society's problems um in this very holistic uh social and moral way uh and the mathematics of, of his economics are, are, I won't say they're an afterthought, because, of course, he majored in, in, in mathematics at Cambridge. That's what he studied as an undergraduate. There, there wasn't the economics program at Cambridge was just getting started when he was uh, at Cambridge at the turn of the 20th century. But he's somebody who is concerned about the great problems of his day. And in his day, the great problems are, uh, are, are, are war and depression. So he's, he's trying to come up with ways to solve these problems that don't involve violence because he's essentially a pacifist, which is you know, a remarkable thing uh, for somebody who 
uh, was the, the chief of British war finance during two world wars to be. But I, I, I think it's still the case that he, he was a sincere pacifist. He did not believe in violence or war. And he, uh, he, he believed that economic policy was, it was sort of an extension of diplomacy. It was a, it was a way of creating, it, it offered the opportunity to create social harmony, both at home and abroad. And, uh, and this makes him a deeply optimistic person because he thinks that if we just get it right on the way resources are, uh, are acquired and distributed, that war and deprivation can be cured, that the idea of poverty and frankly, the idea of serious inequality, he's not an egalitarian because he ultimately thinks that if, you, if, if people are, are well enough off, if they can have the elements of a good life, then, then who cares about serious inequality? Uh, but but they, need to be, they need to have the elements of a good life available to them. But he believes that these are things that, that, that are within the capacity of the political system to solve. As, as early as the 1930s, which is frankly a remarkable thing because the 1930s, the world is mired in the worst depression that anyone has ever understood or, 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 or certainly been able to recollect. Uh, it, it's, it's not totally clear even they've been able, able to measure economic deprivation in this way uh, before. So I, I think if Keynes were around today, you know, he, he would be talking about, uh, dealing with the pandemic because of it, because it's obviously a medical and 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 healthcare emergency but he'd be thinking about the big problems in the world he wouldn't be talking about deficits and dollars and 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 debt and and, and accounting uh standards he, he would be thinking about you know what do we do about climate change what do we do about inequality what do we do about declining life expectancy these are these are matters of of grave social importance that that threaten the stability of democracy, and for him, you know, he's 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 kind of a fancy guy, right? He's not uh, he's not a working class Joe. Uh, he wants to preserve the nice things that he likes about living in the Bloomsbury neighborhood of London at the turn of the century. So that means, you know, being able to drink champagne while a great artist gives you a haircut. That means that means hanging out with Virginia Woolf and talking about books. It means E. M. Forster. Uh, you know, giving you drafts of his book before it's published. Uh, it, it's thinking about art and letters and ideas all the time. And he does not want that lifestyle to be jeopardized by political unrest. And, and he believes that if we do not find some way to democratize that way of living that he enjoyed at the, the turn of the century, then, then there will be a political upheaval that will, that will take those away. And the upper class will, 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 Rue the day, reap the whirlwind, whatever uh, you know, metaphor you want to you want to pick, uh, it, it will ultimately become in it will become impossible for people to enjoy the kind of lifestyle that he enjoyed at that that point in time. But as he gets older, particularly by the end of World War II, he just does not believe in economic scarcity. He thinks that we have we have the ability to feed everybody, to clothe everybody, to house everybody. And the trick is, is, is how to make sure that everyone actually is clothed and fed and housed uh, and, and make sure that they, they, they're not only, not only their, their, their subsistence needs are met, but their, their ability to enjoy life is, uh, is guaranteed. And he feels like if people have that, they're not going to revolt. They're going to feel tied to each other. They're going to feel bound to each other in a, a, a political way. And democracy will be able to do its work. But if you deprive people of this and you have some people who are, uh, to borrow a phrase from George Orwell, more equal than others in the democratic system, then you are going to sow a great deal of discontent. And I think I think it's what we're seeing today. One one of the things I sense from reading your your work is that here is Keynes, with all of his artistic friends, what, what I'll call an, a, a, a bohemian elite rather than an establishment elite, and his freedom of imagination to depart from what I'll call the conventional wisdom or the reinforcement of that. People cite his, his general theory, which before it was hydrolysized. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I would say people like Paul Davidson have illuminated that side, the, the radical uncertainty, the 
uh, lack of what you might call continuity of structure and all kinds of things. But but you have this man who's it's almost like he walks his own walk to his own drummer. Mm-hmm. And where does that come from? I mean, well, first, that, that, that ability not to conform. Sure. First, let me say that Paul Davidson's a real unsung hero in the history of Keynesian thought, because Paul Davidson, a lot of the ideas in my book are, uh, are elaborations on, the ideas that Paul Davidson has been writing about since the 1970s. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and Paul is a really, um, he's just a very important thinker in this history who, who never has fully, I think, been appreciated or rewarded for the work that he has done. He's been marginalized by the economics profession um, because his ideas, frankly, just didn't fit the needs of, uh, of the, uh, I, I hesitate to say hesitate to say corporate establishment because I think it's really more of a more of the the financialization of the economy that took place over the eighties and nineties. It's not just that it's corporate; it's that it became financialized, um, and and so the economics profession just didn't didn't reward people like Paul. Uh, and I think it's really important to give someone like Paul his due um, at at this moment, where I think I think the Keynesian ideas that that Paul uh, had had teased out were uh, are 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 more ascendant i think for keynes himself there is there is a, a certain sort of middle class rebellious spirit to him uh i i i perhaps i'm just projecting on to him but uh you know i, I grew up in the, the suburbs of northern virginia and i played in punk rock bands i was not you know a, a son of deprivation or poverty i you know i i didn't have drug addict friends in in urban New York or something, but I, I played in punk rock bands because I I sort of identified with people who were um, trying to change the system in some way, and I think Keynes has a certain similarity. There was no punk rock at the turn of the twentieth century, but you know he, he he grows up, he goes to Eton, which is one of the you know, most elite and prestigious British boarding schools, and then he he becomes, you know, a a, a very uh, illustrious student at Cambridge University at King's College, and, and I think that experience for him it allows him to understand his own. Uh, I, I think privilege is a word that's thrown a lot thrown around a lot today in, in progressive politics, but it's 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 sort of it makes him feel like the world is something that he can change. He has the ability to, um, to shape it to his, to his will, which is sort of an arrogance of youth and of, uh, and, and of a certain position in society that you get. So he's convinced that he can make the world a better place and that the world will listen to him from a very early age. Uh, but he is then disappointed, deeply disappointed, by his attempts to do that, uh, particularly during World War One and, and, and afterwards, so uh, he has just immense confidence in himself as a result of his social position. Um, but he also is surrounded by artists all the time, and these are people in Bloomsbury who are who are critics of the the existing social order. These are people like Lytton Strachey and Virginia Woolf, who think that the social order of the early 20th century is is kind of rotten and corrupt. They they think that it is uh, it's stuffy and restrictive and and it it prevents free expression and good ideas. And what Bloomsbury ends up doing is is ultimately I think celebrating a particularly elite um, way of way of life. But it does so by rebelling against elite uh, privilege against um, against elite norms. And, and it makes Keynes somebody who is capable of understanding, I think much of, much more of the sort of social uh, continuum than most people can. He can understand working people and he can understand the elite at the same time. And it makes his thought, I think, much more compelling than it would be otherwise. And I sense, there that 
I'm always reminded of my good friend who is died last year, uh, William Grider, mm. who uh, often talked, and I've mentioned it in several of these podcasts, about his faith in young people. And he basically attributed it in a, in a uh, I guess it's a blog post, on a blog he founded in 2009, to the fact that young people have fresh eyes. They see what is wrong, but they haven't been conditioned as to what is feasible or that which will cost them in reputation among the powerful. And so he felt that the impetus to change came from those young eyes. Well, Keynes lived into his 60s, and I sensed he had he had young eyes from wire to wire. Absolutely. And I think that's something that is almost as um, important as his, it, it, it's at least as important as his sort of congenital optimism um, and, and is related to it. You know, he always identified with the next generation. Even when he was writing the general theory in, in 1936, he said, you know, I don't really expect to persuade all of the the economists who have come of age thinking about the about economics this particular way. Now that I have offered this revolution, my real hope is with the next generation. And in even in uh, in the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s, he's there's a, a, a really funny interview with him for a, a British magazine where he says, uh, you know, I, I don't really like the communists, the young communists. I mean, they, I think their ideas are a little bit silly. Um, but but our hope for the future lies in their political maturity. He's, he's still saying mm. they, they, they've got to get over this communism thing. But 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 in their maturity, they're going to be really something special. And they're they're so much more promising than what he said. He calls the old jossers. Um, I've never seen the word josser used in any other context. So I don't know if that is a is a as a particularly nasty slur or something. I, I hope I'm not. Uh, <laughs> Throw, throwing about some terrible British uh, insult from the, the you know, the, the before time. But um, he, he has a deep faith in young people and their capacity to understand and believe in the future um, in a way that he, he thinks that his generation has just become so um, numbed to uh, dysfunction and despair that they can't imagine a world in which in which things actually work in which people are taken care of in which tomorrow is in fact better than than today and i think that that resonates to me certainly uh in, in our present day i i feel like it is very clear in our politics we have a we have a sort of gerontocracy problem where uh not not everybody who is you know over a certain age is is uh is is an enemy to progress but, uh, but there are people who have just become inculcated to a certain way of doing, um, doing politics and making policy, which, you know, in their defense is the way that it has been done throughout their lifetimes, but which clearly has led us into a situation that is disastrous, that anybody who is looking at the world today with fresh eyes is going to say, this is not a good state of affairs. We need to do things differently. And and the people who have who have been making policy over this this period in time, it's not that they're incapable of reflection. It's just that they don't know what else to do. They've been mm -hmm. uh, they've been sort of conditioned in this way. And, and I, I, I have a great deal of sympathy for these people. You know, when I worked as a um, as a banking reporter for a, a company called SNL Financial, which is now part of um, Standard and Poor's Global Intelligence, um, you know, I was constantly surrounded by people talking about the, uh, the the sort of perspective of the financial industry on, uh, on on the world. And so when the bailouts happened, the financial crisis happened in 2008, um, you know, I was always sort of one of the more liberal or, or lefty people in the, in the, in the newsroom. But I, I had a, a basic set of assumptions about what was possible and what could happen that changed when I left that institution. I don't mean to insult that institution. I think it was it was a very good place to work, and they were very good to me, and I learned a great deal there. But but when I left and started working for HuffPost, uh, <laughs> the basic political assumptions at HuffPost were totally different, and mm -hmm. and the the work the, the 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 scope of possibilities, what seemed like a reasonable thing, was very different. 
Um, and I think this happens to people in all sorts of institutions. They, you know, they go off to law school and learn a certain way of thinking, and this is just how it is. And I think it happens in particular within the economics profession. And I think Keynes would have been very, very frustrated by the way thinking within the economics profession has ossified into this kind of uh, mathematical straitjacket. He did not want economists. He didn't think of economists the way we think of economists today. He, he, he talked about them in these, these poetic terms as people who were sort of like, uh, like great enlightenment thinkers. You know, he, he thought the ideal economist was somebody like Isaac Newton or David Hume. He did not think the ideal economist was, was somebody who was exceptionally skilled with econometric models. Um, mm -hmm. he, he wanted economists to be sort of social thinkers, not just uh, mathematicians. And I think the mathematization of the profession over the last uh, couple of decades, which has been enabled, frankly, by people who call themselves Keynesians, people like like uh, you know Paul Samuelson and Robert Solo, um, who you know, also were very great economists. To be clear, uh, you know, I, I think he would he would have been very. Uh, very disturbed by that turn in the profession and, and the influence that it has had on the course of our politics. Yeah, I, um, I mean, you, you look at today and the challenge before us and you see things like his collection of uh, articles, essays in persuasion, economic possibilities for our grandchildren. There was, he was just imaginatively going fishing yeah. in a way that people just aren't doing. I, I've been reading a book recently by a gentleman whose name is William, uh, it's Deresowicz at Yale. It's called Excellent Sheep, The Miseducation <laughs> of the American Elite. And it's about this kind of sterile, technocratic, pretend value-free way of seeing. And in your book, that comes to the surface over and over and over. And, and in Keynes' writing, there is this, what you might call moral reflection about what is a good life? What are our goals? Where, where are we heading? My colleague at INET, Lynn Paramore, just put out a wonderful article with a man named Jeffrey Spear on John Ruskin and Unto the Last. And, mm. and uh, it's, uh, there are people, uh, Eugene McGeher's book, uh, what's it called? Uh, something, uh, Mammon. Uh, it, it's, uh, I'll, I'll remember it. But uh, all of these books are about this kind of what I'll call mindset, almost religious lockdown on imagination and humanism, as if you were a a romantic fool, or if you're you're yeah, a, right. a coward, if you actually explore what matters to humankind, I, I, you know, I, I think with Keynes, uh, the the two, well, I think there are three works that people should read from Keynes uh, that are not the general theory uh, to to get a spirit of his um, to to get the spirit of his his thought. There's the economic consequences of the peace, which is his critique of the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War One in 1919. Um, and then I think there's a, a book called Essays in Persuasion, which I think is now volume nine of the 30 volume set of collected mm -hmm. writings that uh, Cambridge University Press has available. And then there's a book called Essays in Biography, um, which yeah. I think is volume 10. And his essays on people like Isaac Newton, I think are just, they're, they're, they have a sort of magical quality to them. You can just tell that that mm -hmm. is the, that is the stuff that just really captivates him, that, that captures his imagination and makes him, makes him take flight. Um, and, and this idea that uh, the economist is this, uh, <laughs> is this very narrow, technical, mathematical thinker is something that develops over the course of the 20th century and becomes, uh, and becomes concretized, sort of set in stone, um, in, in the, lit, the latter half of the 20th century. Even when people like John Kenneth Galbraith are, are, are studying economics uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, um, the economics world, if you're going to get an economics PhD, you're sort of a weirdo. You're, you're, uh, you're a little more, you're not quite like a philosopher, but you're, you're pretty close to what I think we would call a, a philosophy student today. And I don't mean that in an insulting way. I studied philosophy as an undergraduate too. So 
you know, I, <laughs> I like these weirdos, but, uh, but it was a realm of creativity and experimentation rather than a realm of, um, let's say, uh, of, of orthodoxy. The, the orthodoxy about um, economic policymaking came from government and from the financial sector, but economists themselves were sort of freewheeling types, or certainly more freewheeling types than the type of people you encounter at a uh, American business school today. So um, Keynes liked that, that he liked that milieu. He thought that was he thought that was cool. He was a philosopher who was good at math, and there aren't that many of those people. So economics was uh, was a great place for him. Um, but he he was concerned with societies hanging together. He was not concerned with making sure that equations balance just so. Uh, and you know he wouldn't ignore numbers today, but but he would ask what what the numbers were for. Uh, you know I don't think he'd be afraid of the the, the deficits that countries around the world have been accruing in order to fight the coronavirus pandemic, for instance. But I think he'd be very concerned about um, the policies that those deficits represent. So, you know, during World War II, he wrote a, a very good piece called How to Pay for the War, um, oh, which yeah. was sort of about how to pay for the war, but it was actually really concerned with what economic distribution would look like after the war. How do we finance this war in such a way that when it is over, the richest people in society don't simply become richer uh, as a result of this conflict. So if you just sold bonds, government bonds, then the investor class would would reap all of the benefits from uh, uh, from, from that debt accumulation after the war, and, and working people would get nothing. Um, he was able to sort of process multiple social problems at the same time through the same um, policy mechanism. And he was also willing to change his mind. If it didn't work out, he didn't say, you know, well, this is, this is just how the world is. This is the policy that I, I prescribed. We have to stick to it by hook or by crook. He would, he would change his mind. Um, and uh, I think that flexibility uh, on, on technical policy questions is something that is very admirable. Um, but he was not flexible about his vision for society. He really never loses sight of this idea that everybody can be part of Bloomsbury and that that is the world that you want to, you want to fight for. Uh, and I frankly find it a very difficult vision to argue with who doesn't want to go to the museum every day, who doesn't want to have their hair cut by Virginia Woolf while drinking champagne. That sounds wonderful to me. <laughs> yeah. For everybody it should be, but yes. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I mispronounced, uh, the book I was referring to was The Enchantments of Mammon, How Capitalism Became the Religion of Modernity by Eugene McCarraher. Mm -hmm. And what, what I see at some level is this, what you might call, illusion of free markets, as Bernard Harcourt called it in his famous title. This, this mechanical deference, it's what Charles Kindleberg called... Uh, something like, I can't remember what it is. He had a word or a phrase like a fallacy of concreteness that people are acting like they can stabilize society by pretending that the economy is just a machine. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't quite know, you know, I, I'm very fond of uh, the philosopher John Dewey and Charles Sanders Pierce and those pragmatists Oh yeah, he played around with the notion of uncertainty, and uh, I remember uh, what was the name? Uh, the quest for certainty was the name of Dewey's book, but it illuminated all of the horrid side effects that are analogous to following a demagogue because you want to believe until such time that their charade is unmasked. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've got a quote that I I use very often now. Because I think we are in transition. I think a particular religion has failed, and we've got to kind of sail out into the fog together. And this gentleman, R.C. Zayner at Oxford University, he said, loss of faith in a given religion does not by any means imply the eradication of the religious instinct. It really means, it merely means 
that the instinct temporarily repressed will seek an object elsewhere. Mm-hmm. What I'm hopeful about, and Zach, I, I'm, this is really a question. I'm hopeful that the pain and the tragedy of this pandemic will propel us to see better what matters and define a less icy mechanical fascination with material consumption and we how we say redefine what the good life is you know i think um I, I think the key is for the young. Um, the, the young are um, are the people who are looking to the future with a sense of, uh, of, of sort of um, optimism by necessity. They're going to inherit this world, whatever it is, whether they like it or not. And so they have to think about it as a place that can be better than what we're living in now, because this is clearly intolerable. Um, and I think young people are capable uh, of, of establishing the political conditions that enable uh, a better world to come to fruition. And frankly, I don't think that, you know, I, I have a very dim view of the people who are in power in both the Republican and the Democratic Party uh, at the moment. But I don't think that those people are, are, are riding the zeitgeist. I don't think that that is the trajectory of, uh, of human thought and of human action. I think, uh, I think, I think the kids have it right. And I, I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, talking at universities with younger people and, uh, and you know, these, this is, this is a really terrific uh, younger generation that's coming up. I, I, I'm a millennial. I'm 37 years old. And so I'm, I'm past the point where I get to claim, um, you know, that the, the advantages of youth, I, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty well into middle age at this point. Um, but I, I got to tell you, young people in on college campuses, uh, in high schools, who are thinking about these ideas, they are ready to do something bigger and better than what our generations have done. And, and I think they can do it. I, I, I genuinely think they can because I don't have any choice. You know, either they're going to do it or we're going to see mass death. Well, I hope you're right. And, and Zach, I would, you may be 37 years old. That looks like youth to me, but uh, <laughs> standing here at 63. But I'm going I'm to ask you to go back to an old song. All right. If you're, th- if you're feeling old, My Back Pages by Bob Dylan. I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. <laughs> in this book that you've written, you're rising to the occasion. It's it's almost a beautiful coincidence because I know you didn't see the pandemic coming when you wrote the book. But what we need are beacons. What we need are models of a way forward, a way of mind, of what greatness and vision constitute. And you painted a beautiful portrait of a fascinating man. And so I think, I think you've got young eyes and, uh, and I think, I think you're a big contributor to the the world that we need and to the, to the pathway forward, because you both, I, I, I read this quote from Muriel Rukeyser about there's kind of two types of traditions there's the people like Melville who point out what's wrong, and there's the people like Walt Whitman who teach us how to dream. Mm-hmm. And you do both of those things beautifully. Ah, well, that is a very high compliment. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever yeah. compared me to Walt Whitman and Herman Melville before, Rob, but I will <laughs> take it. <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're in that framework, and in, uh, in, in this book, I know, like I mentioned, our friends with Guy Saperstein and the, the group, uh, they were just overjoyed. Our mutual friend, RJ Escal got you on for a podcast right away. And he was effusive and your, your review reviews are deservedly strong and enthusiastic. And that's true even within all the establishment media right now. So you've, you've, you've tickled our fancy 
and you've rung our bell. And I want to thank you for being here with me today and making a difference. All right. Thanks so much, Rob. I really appreciate your time. You know, we'll, we'll talk again before too many months pass, about the time your book tours are over. And though they, they may all be electronic for a bit of time, but uh, I'm, sure we, I'm sure my audience will want to see us come back and compare notes in the not too distant future. I'm sure I'll be able to wrangle another book out of this, so we can talk about that if, if not oh. before then. <laughs> all right. All right take, take care. care. Thanks. Bye bye. Uh, and check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.